What's good, everybody? Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Over Quota. Please don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review if you haven't already. And if you're a regular listener of my podcast, you know what I'm about to say next. Like always, the J. David Group is sponsoring this podcast. My company helps high-growth software companies recruit top software sales leaders and salespeople. So go to the jdavidgroup.com to learn more. No more forward slashes. I was getting tricky with the landing pages, but we'll just go to jdavidgroup.com to learn more. And today, my guest today is Bradley Pastor. He's the Vice President of North American Sales at Risk Methods, which helps companies identify, assess, and mitigate risk within their supply chain. Bradley, welcome to Overquota. Thank you, Jay. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So let's just start there. Tell me a little bit about um, risk methods and your role there. And actually, even before that, roll us up through how you actually got to risk methods and then talk to me about um, what your role there is at risk methods. Sure. I, I'll, I'll give you the abbreviated version of how I got here. So I was uh, working for a company based out of New Jersey by the name of RSAM. They were in the um, uh, risk and compliance space. So um, you know, companies like uh, RSA Archer and things like that, they do governance risk compliance, that's an area they were in. And they were acquired by a Vancouver-based company. So uh, as with most acquisitions, the leadership team moves on. So I, I left there and I had part of the summer to take a look at other opportunities. And I really liked what Risk Methods was doing in a similar space, still risk. Uh, they focus on risk and supply chain and went had a long interview process with them, flew out to Germany to meet the, the founders of the company, did a couple board interviews, and we were able to come together about a year and a half ago. Tell me what your role is there. And actually, just as you talk about, you know, the, your interview process, tell me what were the, why were they interviewing for you, you for that position? In other words, what did they need from you uh, that they thought you could bring um, to them? Sure. So. The company has been around for almost eight years in Germany and in the U.S. for roughly about four years. And they had a leadership team in the U.S. which was able to open the U.S., build a recurring revenue base in the U.S., and the sales leadership just decided to move on after a couple of years. You know, there's different people fit in differently at different levels and scales of a company. You know, I, I tend to focus on sort of the, the smaller size in terms of revenue. You know, I'm not running a hundred million dollar business, right? Nor would you want a hundred million dollar person running the size that I'm in. So typically it's a skill set that when you need to hire, bring, start from zero, it's fairly commonplace for those sales leaders to move on after a period of time. And uh, their sales leader moved on and they went through an interview process to take a look at bringing on a new sales leader. And the entire process was maybe about six and a half months from you know, initial touch point to end. And my understanding in terms of what they liked, what I brought it to it was, I had a general understanding of the space. I don't come from procurement, which is where we sell into, but I understand risk and have sold into cost centers. So the people we sell into don't generate revenue for a company. They typically are focused around cost mitigation. So it's a different sales cycle selling to people that don't generate revenue or selling into that. The other part about it was I like building and scaling smaller teams. So I'd done that in a couple of different places and that fit in terms of the culture and alignment. So again, you might find a, a great regional VP at Salesforce, right, who maybe runs New England and is, covers a larger book of business than my entire company, but that person wouldn't align culturally with what we're looking for. So I'm ultimately responsible for our direct sales, our sales development reps, our pre-sales people, our technical sales people, and our alliances and our account management. So I cover pretty much all those go-to-market functions for risk methods in North America. What do you like specifically about building and scaling teams? I, I think it's, it's really one of the few things that when you're a knowledge worker, you can point to and say, this was done, right? So if I was in construction or landscaping, I could take my family by and be like, oh, we built that house or, or we look at the beautiful hardscape we put in the patio, the this and that. There's very few things in sales. What are you going to do? You can be like, oh, here's the PO, the deal I closed. Yay, right? <laughs> um, 
it's different though saying the team was this. And when I left or during my period of time here, the team became that. And as part of that, you also promoted people. People got married, people had kids, people rented a place, people got their first car. They grew as a person, as an individual. And it, from my perspective and the way that I'm wired, I think there's very few opportunities professionally to do that. So I don't wanna sit in a room and look at a spreadsheet all day and call people up and ask them why forms weren't filled out or what were their call metrics. I think those things should be given. What I want to understand is someone closes their first five digit deal mm -hmm. and be part of that shared experience. I want to be able to promote someone. I want to be able to adjust someone's compensation based upon their performance and have it be a meaningful measure to them and see what they're able to do for that. And, you know, for me, this size and scale of companies gives me the best opportunity to do that. And it aligns with me, aligns with me culturally and just the way that I like to work and engage with people, which is in a more intimate setting. Um, to this point, and maybe this is a, a tough question to answer because the chapter hasn't been, or the book hasn't necessarily been finished yet, if you will. I'm not sure, sure what, what, what metaphor to use here, but <laughs> my question is, is that, um, what have you implemented or changed since you've gotten there? that you can look to and say, yeah, like this wasn't here before, that's here now. And I'm really proud of it. Kind of like the hardscape analogy that you just used. Right, so th there's, you know, a couple different ways. And, and I like the, the view of, you know, multiple people watching the same movie and everyone has their same perspective on it. So on one hand there's, you know, I have a 3060-90-day uh, plan, I call it 369. I have all these really well formatted spreadsheets and floats and all this other stuff all that's good and well, and I think that's a way to measure it. So there's a Bradley that is that. There's another Bradley, which is, I, I just want people to show up and give their best, whatever their best is. And then, you know, there's sort of this in-between. And, and I think I fall in the in-between. And so how does that relate to your question? Which is, certainly the expectation is in, we need to hit the number, right? That That's a given, the business, everything's built around that. However, inside that, there's a lot of aspects that make up a good team. There's a lot of aspects that make up the contribution to the number. So what I wanna see is progression. And what I wanna see is a commitment to being better. And then we as a company and we as a team will work on what's that time frame for achieving that. And we'll make sure that the team has the appropriate tools and environment they need to be successful, right? Mm -hmm. And if we can get those alignments, then so I call it like spreadsheet Bradley, and then the Bradley, which is just, hey, when you show up and be your best, I think those two things can align with each other, right? And then you build, people call it a high-performing team, but that's where you get there, right? High-performing teams are not built of a bunch of high performers. High-performing teams are built with a bunch of people who have a commitment to perform better, is my opinion, right? Yes, it's so interesting too. And I'm, I'm tempted to, to wonder how you go about, you know, driving that result or driving that behavior in terms of getting high performance teams to perform. Well, well, I guess I'll just ask it. <laughs> how, how, <laughs> I had another question, but how, how do you go about <laughs> doing that, um, you know, to, to, to get a, a particular group of individuals to, to, to drive towards that one goal and, and, and become a high performing team? It's it's hard, and I wouldn't say that that I figured it out. And I, I'd say no one has ultimately figured it out. There, there's still people still need to have the internal drive to do it. What I believe it's it's important is that the drive needs to be aligned with the opportunity, and then you need to help people understand what that opportunity is. So a lot of times, what I've seen, whether it's me personally or other people professionally, is they stop trying because the finish line is just so far away. And, and it's not, the, oh, it's a sprinting metaphor, it's a marathon metaphor, it's this or that. If you're running 50 yard sprints and everyone else has already finished, that is still far away, right? Um, so, and, I, and I've run marathons and done that. And, and you know, if you've ever done any of those things, you, you're halfway to the finish line and the, and the winners have already done, right? And you're like, oh, geez, I still got more to do. And it can feel that way if you're chasing quota. It can feel that way if you're, if you're trying to get meetings and get out there. So 
what you want to do again, I come back to this concept all the time is where are you focusing your energy being supportive in a manager in terms of, all right, if you lost the deal, okay, that, that might be good. And it might be good from the perspective. Now you're not spending your time focusing on that, but what are the things that you can control? You can control how you show up. You can control how you engage in your presentations. You can control the quality of your interactions with the client. You can control what was your analysis on the deal? Are you bringing other people in? So when you, I'll, I'll answer a little bit different. Everyone says that they want open and honest feedback. No one really wants open and honest feedback, right? So what you try to bridge is you as a manager, you need to make yourself open and honest. You need to be empathetic. You need to make yourself vulnerable. And if you do those things, then your team hopefully will understand that if you're giving that of yourself, they can get it of themselves. And what comes out of it is they then feel comfortable saying, I'm having a problem or I'm having a challenge. I need help with this. And then you can help them be successful. And you know, there are instances where it doesn't work out and you know, they might need to be in a different role or they might need to be a different company. And those are completely different scenarios. But ultimately, when you think about what makes successful salespeople, it's resilience and it's the ability to move on, right? And I think that what makes us strong is people. And ultimately, I mean, sales, you think about, you know, you think about what your, your organization does you could have really great candidates, right? You could think they're really great for that role and just for whatever reason, it doesn't happen. You can't just turtle and just close up shop, right? It's like, nope, we're going to go forward. Maybe it wasn't this, maybe it wasn't that. And it's the same thing with sales. And the best salespeople I've ever seen are actually the people that have resilience. It's not the salesperson who crushed it for three years during you know, uh, the best economy ever. And now they're presented with a territory that needs to be completely built from scratch and they don't know where to go, right? Right. Speaking of people, um, you know, I know that one of the things you've said and listening to you and talking with you in the past is, is that, you know, people typically will work for people and you've worked for people in the past as opposed to companies. Tell me uh, a little bit about that and, and the role that people and perhaps maybe mentors have played in, in your career. So it's taken me a long time to figure this out. And initially, early in my career, it was, oh, I could get a $5,000 raise. So I'm going to go and jump. And maybe if you're making 35 and going to 40, that that's significant. And don't get me wrong. If someone's going to cut me, you know, mail me a check for $5,000, I'd absolutely cash it and take it. I don't want to mar- minimize, you know, that amount. Right. And then you're like, oh, I want to, I want a title, right? So I've, I've always been this. I'm going to go for that. And when you wash through all those things at the end, those things really, they matter in some respect. You want enough money to execute and do the things that are important to you. To, you know, I have three kids, my wife works, but you know, we, we want to be able to provide for our children. Otherwise, like, why am I working? So you, if those things are taken care of and organizationally you're respected, it really comes down to what are the interpersonal relationships and who you want to spend your time with. And when I look back at and, there, and there's a handful of people who have positively impacted my career and even smaller amount who negatively impacted, but even those people, I still looked at and said, okay, this is the type of leader I don't want to work for, right? Or these are the type of people I don't want to work with. And so I feel like I've reached the point where it sounds trite, but working for good people really, like it really matters. And it's hard to figure that out. And it's really, really hard during an interview process to figure that out because everyone puts on their date face, right? It's the first date, everyone's here, everyone's great. And then you don't find out till later on that, you know, they don't open the door for you or they never help pay for the dinner or whatever it is, right? Your parents don't like them. It's the same sort of thing with work, but you, you want we spend so much time at work, right? And you spend so much time thinking about work that why wouldn't you want to work with what I define as, as good, solid people? And I can say without a doubt, people ask me about my team. I'm like, my team, solid people. Like I, I enjoy being around my team. I hope they enjoy being around me. Um, and it's not like, oh, because we're all friends or in certainly with the pandemic, you know, we, it's not like we can all go hang out, right? So it's, those aren't the aspects of them, but I enjoy them as people. I enjoy their effort, the work that they put in. My leadership team, the people I work for, uh, Bill, Heiko, my partner in HR, Leah, 
Like, I feel that there's a sincere commitment that we want both the company to grow, but we also want the people to grow. And the way that we grow the company is by growing the people, right? So we don't all have to be best friends. We don't have to invite everyone to everyone's weddings or whatever, but do, is there mutual respect? Can you work with each other? Can you have hard conversations and not have it be like, Bradley was mean to me? Um, no, but maybe sometimes you have to have those hard conversations and part of hard conversations, you need to call people out, right? So it, it's, again, in my mind, it's just absolutely critical that when you're evaluating places to go, you understand those. So how do you do that? Um, LinkedIn, awesome resource, right? You reach out, you find people behind it. You, you take a look through it and you say, all right, who do I know or who do I respect in that environment? And what are they gonna tell me about the organization? Interestingly enough, I didn't have any of that with risk methods. So I, there was a large aspect of it, which is I took a leap of faith around going to risk methods, but all the interactions I had with everyone was straight up. People were honest. Uh, the person in HR I was working with always very responsive back to my, any outreach I had to him. When I sent people follow-up emails, they responded back to them. You know, so all those sort of like check the box things were there in it. And when I think back about opportunities that didn't work, all those boxes weren't checked, right? You send a follow-up, no one respond back. You would submit expenses from doing an interview and they wouldn't pay them, right? And you, you go like, okay, so now if I'm working there, how, how is this going to be, right? Like right. this is an interview process. They should be putting on their date face too. And, and I can't get a $20 cab ride expensed. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. How are they going to deal with me as an employee if my kid's sick right. or if I'm having struggles or if I need to raise my hand and say, I need help? What, why should, what should be the level of interaction there if they just don't have empathy for people at a personal level? And I don't know how, how your business has been impacted, but you look in terms of COVID and, you know, what holds us together are those personal relationships. So if you work for an environment and a company where you don't have a personal relationship, if you're single or if you're living by yourself and all those other things, like work is your lifeline. Yeah, for sure. And it's specifically in, in my business, you, you alluded to is, you know, since I don't have a product, right. It's not like something I can demo for you or pull off the shelf and say, or say, you know, look at all these people using my product right now, or isn't it great, right? My product is, is great people. And, you know, once you right. have a great person get hired, then you have to replenish that person. So for me, it really is all about relationships, frankly, you know, because there's, you can't necessarily, necessarily differentiate service. You can differentiate by um, building relationships and sustaining relationships um, for sure, right? And so that to me is is, is really important. Um, I'm curious, a couple of things that you had said that I want to go back on. One is you mentioned vulnerability in conversations and how folks can, um, you know, if you're showing vulnerability, that typically opens up the door for them to be vulnerable and to probably accept, um, you know, the hard conversations, if you will, sure. right? Is that something that is prescriptive? In other words, do you sit down on your, whether, you know, whether it's a weekly or monthly cadence of, of one-on-ones, is it something that's less formal where you're having ongoing conversations and then they can just see that, oh, Bradley is, you know, he's, he, he's open, he's, you know, he's so comfortable and, and honest and those types of things. Like, what is it exactly? You're just airing your dirty laundry every time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Put my feet up, pour yeah. a glass of wine. Let's just talk. Um, it's, it's a combination of the two. So I think about, so on Mondays we run forecast calls and it, I don't know what was going on. Like I, my head honestly was just not screwed on straight. I, I could not pull things together. And in just during my forecast calls, I finally said, well, I'm like, hey, like, I'm sorry. I'm just, I'm not, almost like you need to guide me through the forecast call because I just, I'm here, I'm engaged, but I, there's like so much sloshing around my head right now mm -hmm. that I just can't give you the time that you need. And one of my one of my old uh, bosses, guy I respect a lot, Bill Dietrich, he would say, "I have some feedback for you. Are you open to hearing it right now?" And I and I just thought like that simple add-on mm. is brilliant. And it, when he first said, it, I was like, "Right, like of course everyone's going to say yes." And he actually said it to me one time. He's like, "Hey, we did our one way." He's like, "Hey, I just got some feedback for you. Do you are, are you open to it?" And I thought about it. I'm like, "No, actually, I'm not." Like, I just don't want to hear it now. 
And <clears throat> he's like, okay, when would be good? And I'm like, you know what, tomorrow, let's, let's connect tomorrow. And then when we had the call tomorrow, I was just so much more receptive and he raised some points. And I was like, yeah, you know what, like that's actually pretty valid. Mm-hmm. And I was more receptive to it. So, you know, part of, part of being open to your point, it, it's not so much like, oh, let me open up about myself, but it's also being open to the other people. And, you know, I, I, you know, sometimes I forget to do things, shocker, uh, but I want my team to call me out. So there might be times where it's end of the month or end of the quarter and we'll get hammered with a bunch of NDAs. You know, one of them might slip through the process and I'll send a note to my team and I'm like, hey, you know, who sent an NDA? Did I miss any of it? And, and like these things seem like little simple things. And so I might be listening and be like, oh, whatever, it's a little NDA. But those things where you're, you as a manager, you're raising your hand and being like, I might've forgotten to do something and help me understand what it is. People be like, yeah, you know, so if you allow yourself to be called out, I think then you open yourself, you open the team up for those conversations and dialogue. And, and you know, I made the comment earlier about everyone says they want open Austin awesome feedback. And I thought of a saying like everyone doesn't, and there is some truth to that, right? So everyone doesn't want that level of feedback. So how you can position it, how you have those conversations, that's going to differ person to person in the way that they interact and what someone might perceive as open on us. Someone could view that as being hostile or, or you're engaging. So asking people how they want feedback, asking people how it passed, asking people what's the best way I can help you. And if people say, well, you know, I'm fine, there's nothing, it's actually following up and saying, well, how about I do this for you? Right. Right. So, you know, if I say, hey, Jay, how can I help you? And you're like, hey, I'm, I'm fine. You don't need anything. And I said, well, how about, you know, I know some people here, or how about I take a look at some proposals, or you're getting an RFP done, why don't you give me some of the questions and I'll work through it? They might say yes. Mm-hmm. And then that builds that trust in relationship. People don't work for me, mm-hmm. right? They work for the company and they work to achieve their goals and expectations. I view my role as helping fulfill that, right? They don't, they don't work for me. Right. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, almost in a, a supporting them, a supportive role as opposed to, uh, you know, a, I don't know, a dictator role or something like that, right? Yeah, I don't think that works, do. right? Yeah, right. Um, I want to talk, shift a little bit to talk about adversity, I guess, as it pertains to, to this and, 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 and working with people. Um, you had a unique experience um, or one of the more unique experiences on September 11th, 2001. Um, tell me about that day and why that particular, you know, that day was, was obviously more harrowing for you than a lot of other folks. Sure. So in, in, to put it in context, um, <clears throat> it, it, it was harrowing. We were fortunate, didn't lose anyone on the scale of the thousands of people and then the, the thousands of people who were impacted by it you know, insignificant on the scale of things. Um, that said, there was like a good hour that was probably much more impactful for my wife than for me. So to fill the readers in, um, I was working for a company called, by the name of eRoom, which got acquired by Documentum. And my sales manager I was working with, Rob Doherty, was already down, I think, in Bedminster. So we were selling heavily into pharmaceutical. And if you're familiar with it, Bedminster in New Jersey, tons of pharma companies down there. And I was flying in that morning. So I flew from Newark, uh, from Boston to Newark. And if you're familiar with what happened on 9-11, uh, that morning, there were, they, the government, whoever thought that some of the, right, no one knew where the flights were coming from. And there were some thoughts that they knew it was from Boston, but they thought they didn't know where it was. So I landed, I think, a couple minutes after the first tower was hit, I'm trying mm-hmm. to recall. And then got my rental, drove out, and then I was listening to Howard Stern. People used to listen to terrestrial radio back in the day, right? And I'm listening to Howard Stern. You're in New York. You listen to him driving out. And then it was the second tower got hit. And because it's Howard Stern, I was like, this is a joke, right? Sick joke, but it's a joke. And then you find out it's not. So I try to call my wife. She's an attorney. She was doing pro bono work at a school in, in Boston, and I couldn't get through to her. The school she was at got locked down. Um, you know, all those things started happening. But she, her, her thought was, I was in one of the planes, because why wouldn't you think that, right? And then you know, we drove out 
to, we, I met up with Rob, we spent the day, the airspace was closed, we drove back. I remember we returned his rental, we ran a person who was covered in soot. The person had actually walked out of uh, downtown, I think walked over one of the bridges, got a taxi as soon as they crossed the bridge and then went to the first car rental place they could, mm. which is over by Newark, which is where we were turning, I think Rob's car. So, you know, blood on his face and you really got a sense of, <clears throat> Yeah, you know, th- this is a really big problem. And folks at Everham were calling and reaching out and making sure we are. And we had a sales team that was, I think, in Kentucky and they drove back because the airspace was closed. But it, it was really one of those scenarios where you know, it-, it was those personal connections. And it was one of the-, the first times earlier on in my career where I understood a corporation could be personal. Mm-hmm. Right. So everyone at Everham stopped and it was, mm-hmm. and we had a very specific. Uh, expense policy and we were trying to grow the company and all those things were controlled down. It was, I remember the CEO, Jeffrey Beer was like, do whatever. And and Eric Fisher, our VP of sales, do whatever, spend whatever. We don't care. You need to rent a car. You need to do this. We don't care. We want to make sure you're okay. We want to make sure you're safe and all those things. And it was that sort of empathetic relationship in leadership where you're like, okay, here's a really bad scenario that happened. Uh, It took us a long time to get back, but it also made my relationship with the people I worked with a shared experience. It made the relationship with the company where I was like, wow, there's real humans behind what we do. I was eventually able to get in touch with my wife who was uh, clearly overjoyed about the whole thing, um, fortunately, right? And, um, <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's one of those things where I keep in the back of my mind and I view in the context of how did a company interact with that? And I view it in terms of, I was working in Boston when the Boston Marathon bombing happened. And I remember I called my boss who was in New York and was like, I'm leaving, right? And they were like, well, why are you leaving? And I'm like, I am gone. I am out of this building, I am going home. And you know, sort of you contrast the two interactions and it's one where it's all about the person, whatever you need, spend whatever you want. We don't care. You wanna stay in a hotel room, whatever, expense it, do it. Versus, yeah, there's a bombing in Boston, I'm going home, and then you get questioned on why, mm. right? And it's just the juxtaposition between the two interactions of it. And one is very human, and one is very corporate. Right. And at the young age of 49, and being in the position where I can hopefully positively impact people's lives around me, I want to be human. Mm. I don't want to be corporate. Right. Cool thing. I was actually listening to that same Howard Stern show. I remember he was interviewing Pamela Anderson actually during that uh, during that time, and um, and yeah, it was just just vivid when he said we're under attack, and uh, it was something that uh, an episode that will always be seared in my mind. So you and I were connected in that way way back. It is just it's just bonkers, right? I mean, you think about it. It's so hard. We're so far removed from it. And we're we're generation beyond it. Yep. To, to have in that in that span of time where you think it's just him just being him mm-hmm. and then the complete opposite side of that. And we know a lot of people in New York and I, I sold in the finance market for a while and you go into companies like Eat Vance where, you know, virtually the entire firm was wiped out. Mm-hmm. You're mm-hmm. just like, holy shit, right? Mm-hmm. Like how, you know, and, and, and my wife's firm, they lost people in it. And, and it's just, you know, people don't have context now around what it was like and the shared experience, you know, again, I'm not comparing mine, you know, it's just sort of a a point in time thing, how that ripples out and how it impacts. And now even all these years later, I look at that and, you know, I made the comment to to other people where I still reach out to people on September 11th. I'm like, Hey, remember where we were. Right. Mm -hmm. And I have such a tiny little sliver of that story. So what about uh, just adversity now in the sales process and just with, with sales, in general, right? Or as, as a sales leader, or just people who are practitioners in sales are always going to need to uh, face adversity and then overcome adversity. Um, how have, what adversity, talk to me a little bit about some of the adversity that you've faced in your career. How have you been able, able to overcome it? And then, um, you know, how do you, how have you been able to overcome it? And then how do you prescribe other folks to really think about some of the challenges that they've had to move on to, you know, and overcome their adversity in sales? Sure. Uh- well, I'll, I'll sort of approach a different way, which is from the perspective of, of maybe hiring people. And then I'll, I'll circle back into that question if it's okay with you, Sure. which is I want to see, so resilience is, I, is a really important theme mm-hmm. um, in the way, in my life, the way that I look at it. And you, know, you have 
customers that churn. So you may have a customer that leaves. We have deals that we're going to win. You're going to have deals you're going to lose. And what you want to see is you want to see people having that resilience to focus on what they need to do to achieve their goal. And their goal is typically for us in sales, it's hitting the number. And when I evaluate resumes that come across, I look for people who have adversity and they've overcome that. So because when I have people on the team, I want people who've actually, you know, had had to work through something and I want to see that they've come out the other side. And, and there's a wide range of what that is, right? So it could have been, I remember I had a guy who worked for me who didn't go to college. When you ask him why he didn't go to college, he's like, you know, my mom was a single parent. There was an opportunity to work out of high school. I started working in sales. I did really well and I've just continued to do well and there's no reason to go back. And you're like, oh, okay, like that makes sense, right? And there's a massive track record to support that. Mm -hmm. And you're like, that's awesome, right? You see it a lot of times with, uh, with veterans where there's clearly adversity and adversity could be they served or adversity could be they were away from their family or, you know, however it is, there are people who've been laid off. Um, so you look and you go through all those things and, and you don't want to get into this whole of like, Again, sort of like 9-11, like my adversity is more than your adversity. You just want to see something in there. Mm -hmm. and, and it's the perfect resumes that actually cause me pause, right? Mm -hmm. This person for 20 years, they've always been 100%. You're like, okay, what happens if they come and they actually have to work their territory? What are they going to do, right? And we're trying to grow a company and we have, there is adversity every day. And part of that is the recognition about the mission we have, the goals we have to achieve, and for where we sell into, which again, it's we sell into a cost center. So part of our value proposition is cost mitigation. And I think that if you have people who understand adversity, work through it, they're actually better in terms of selling into that space, right? Mm -hmm. Because if you're thinking about cost avoidance, it's it's risk mitigation, it's cost mitigation. I'm saying to you, Jay, hey, we can, we're probably not gonna help your top line, we can help you with all these other things. And all those other things typically are, are personal, mm -hmm. right? So if you understand that and you're able to have that conversation with people, I believe it comes through. Mm -hmm. And I think it comes through as being authentic. And so it, again, it's not something that you can really flush out in an interview. You don't wanna say like, oh, tell me about a time, but you can during an interview saying, give me a scenario where you lost a deal. What was that like? And if you hear terms and you hear comments around yeah, we lost the deal. I sat down with my team. We evaluated what we did. We evaluated what we didn't do. I took inventory about it. I tried to, you know, we did some more prepping sessions. You're like, okay, here's someone who gets it, right? She knows what it's going to take versus, yeah, we lost a deal because they went with someone else. Mm. I, I, what, I, that doesn't tell me about anything you've moved through in terms of that process, right? What if you've come sort of your own expectations or company expectations and, and you've had to move through your own sort of challenges, right? Because you talk about being vulnerable with your, with sure. your team, perhaps maybe that is something that you're thinking about during interviews. Tell me a little bit about, about that and, and how you've been able to overcome your own uh, challenges. Sure. So I think part of that is stories are really important. So when I look at, at my jobs and my careers, and I have what I'll define as a little bit of lumpiness in my resume, and or I've called it people zigzaggy in my career, I start off in tech support, and then I did product management. I was a sales engineer. I was a sales engineering team. I was an individual contributor. I ran alliances, was in alliances, you know, I went back like all over the map. And you, and you look and you go, like, what do you mean you're VP of sales? You didn't start off as an SDR and a BDR and inside sales and a junior A and a, you know, that whole rah, 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 yeah. through it. <laughs> right. And I go, no, right? And so that's why I have a natural inclination towards people who've had the adversity. But I've I've um, gone through and, and left very lucrative jobs where I was well-respected to chase a title and it hasn't worked out. So you have to eat a lot of humble pie for that. Mm -hmm. And part of maturation and growing up is that you realize that there are certainly external factors that come to play, but ultimately you as an individual are responsible and you need to own your decisions. Right. And until you get to that point, I don't think that you can grow. So I'm sure, I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm sure. Um, there might be one or two people who might listen to the podcast and be like, 
I worked for Bradley 10 years ago and he's not like that. And I'd like to say, well, I've grown and I've matured and I've evolved and I've developed as a person, I've developed as a leader and, and as a human being. And that's what we want. I think you, you want to see growth and you want to believe that there's a better spot. And if you're able to convey that and you're able to move forward, then that's, that's where you go through the adversity, right? So it's, it's not, uh, I read something online the other day where it was talking about a scar in a tree. Hmm. It was like, the scar is always the same size, but the tree grows. Hmm. And as the tree grows, that scar gets smaller. I like that. Yeah. Right. And I was like, oh my God. And I tried to look it up and I couldn't find the source. And I was like, oh my God, this is brilliant. And you'd think yeah, with yeah. Google, like I could find it. Right. Or, <laughs> um, you know, it, it's, it's having that and you just look at it and you're like, geez, you know, on, on more often than not, are we going to move this through? And, and I look and, and listen, there, there are absolutely days where I'm like, I wish I could do more. Or I wish I can give more or, you know, I, I could have been better on, but what you realize is that you, you singularly can't do that. And that's not a failure. What it means is that you need to work with your team and you need to work, you need to move through it. And that's where the concept of resilience and being adaptive and having that perseverance and getting people and sharing that vulnerability around it. Look, don't, don't get me wrong. I absolutely love to win. And I've done quota club and gone on the cruises and I was able to, you know, when my wife and I first got married, pay off student loans with commission checks. And I love, I don't care the size of the deal. I mean, there's some people like, oh, I only love the certain size of the deal. Bullshit, right? Like I cl a team closes a deal or if I'm involved in closing a deal, that's awesome. Like I don't care. It's just as hard to close a small deal as it is a large deal. So, you know, this isn't like, let's replace performance with fuzzy what i think is somewhere between to do the football metaphor somewhere between pete carroll and bill belichick there's a way right and i i think that's the way when i look at it that we can lead and an approach and you know set out those expectations so we we hired a sales rep about four months ago and during the conversation i was like look you work for, this is, this is how I am. Right. And if you're cool with that as a manager, then we're going to get along really, really well. And, you know, here's the expectations. Here's what we want. And I'd wish I could hire everyone. That isn't the case, but you want to get people who are aligned. And, you know, I've, I've gotten really positive feedback on the people we brought on board and hopefully this is an environment where they want to stay and be successful and we can create that for them. Right. And that'll continue to per, permeate through the organization. And do you just grow through, I shouldn't say, I don't want to push it, position it that way, but there's growing through experience and then there's growing through, um, I don't know, seeking growth, right? Being growth-minded, whether it be listening sure. to podcasts like this or reading. I'm actually listening to, um, because I'm so busy, I listen to books now as opposed to read, but um, How to Win Friends and Influence People, something that I've been meant right. to listen to forever. And now I'm, I'm getting around to it. And it was because uh, I was asking somebody else who I interviewed for this podcast who's coming up in another episode about people who have challenges during the interview process in terms of speaking in non sequiturs and the whole nine yards and just how do you actually, you know, where, where can you go to actually improve those types of things? So when you look at, you know, experience is obviously a great teacher, if you will. Right. Um, or what, what, how, do, how else do you seek growth in figuring your way through things? Or maybe it's just experience. That tree analogy was perfect, by the way. Right. Well, experience can be good or bad, right? You get a lot of bad experience. You can work for a lot of toxic people and you could take a good person. They come out not being all there, right? Hmm. So there's a couple of different things. I mean, there are, I, I listen to a lot of podcasts. Certainly I listen to yours. Um, <laughs> I, good plug there. No, but I do. Uh, I also, I, I love listening to Joe Rogan. Only one, it's long, so it gets meaty hmm. and be in long conversations yield to a lot of good insights uh, and he has a lot of people just from different perspectives and I'll, I'll tie this all together. Mm -hmm. Jocko Wilnick really like his concepts on responsibility and leadership. Um, there are people who I follow on social media, David Goggins, um, Cameron Hayes, who are just, you're just like, holy cow, like how, how can they fit that much life mm -hmm. 
into 24 hours, right? right. And so I always joke Cameron Hayes is my spirit animal where the dude, he'll run a half marathon. He works a full-time job for a utility company out there. And then he'll come home, lift weights, practice bow hunting, and repeat again. You're just like, I, I could barely shower today, right? You're, right. you're just like, hey, but we're both the same human being. But you're like, there's no possible way. Um, For the same hours in the day, by the way. Yeah, right. it's impossible. Uh, I give huge amount of credit to my leadership team because one of the things they offered for me was executive coaching. So there's a gentleman, Charlie Jane, who I work with, who's mm -hmm. just been really awesome. Combo therapy, combo focus. And he's been great just in terms of helping me professionally, which I think falls into personal around like, what's your guiding star, right? And then once you figure out what that is, then you build the plan around it. And I'd say I probably had that a little bit backwards where I was like, oh, here's the things that are important and you focus on what's important, but really you need to focus on where you wanna be. And then what are those drivers that go into that? So he's provide valuable insight in terms of that. Hmm. Um, the other aspects of it are there's been great people I've I've worked for in the past. Uh, you know, I mentioned a couple of them who I look in terms of scenarios that they do, or I reach out to them and say, "Hey, help me." You know, what do you think? Uh, Revenue Collective. Uh, I know it's you know popular on LinkedIn, but there is an aspect that when you reach operational level in a company, VP and above, you're almost reluctant to ask for help because you should know all the, they hire me because I know all the answers. You're like, well, right. actually I don't know all the answers. So having a group of people you can go and ask those questions to, I found just to be you know, significantly valuable. And then from there, it's honestly, it's a combination of old fashioned stuff. My, my wife is uh, my best friend and my partner. I asked her her opinion. My mom who's deceased, I look back on, um, when she was working and engaged, she used to work for Estee Lauder and she was consistently a top salesperson there. And that's all personal. And then and, and I remember her telling me stories about engaging with people. And then my father, who's been retired, you know, some of the continuity of the relationships he's have are people he's done business with, right? And you and you look and you go, okay, what are those elements and what are those things that are important? And so I, I try to pull in all of those aspects of how do I how do I develop and ultimately the thread with all of those is about taking responsibility. Hmm. So, you know, I mentioned leaving a job and chasing a title. I could place all sorts of blame on why it didn't work. Ultimately, I left because I chased a title. Right. I need to own that. Right. right. And until you own that, it doesn't matter. And it's the same thing about losing a deal. The reasons why deals get lost, there's also a lot of reasons why maybe that other 10% wasn't put into the deal. Hmm. So we talked about vulnerability and open and honest feedback and all those things. And part of it is you sit here and you go, you know, Jay, if you and I work with each other, I'd say, Jay, well, do, do you really think you did everything you could have done for that deal? And if you've been working for me a while, you'll probably sit there and go like, mm, you know, and sort of look around and say, I probably could have done this better. Right. And then the question is, all right, how could I have helped you in terms of figuring that out? Or what do we need in terms of doing that? Or how can we approach and resolve that? What you want is maybe it'll happen another time, but it sh certainly shouldn't happen a third time. Like shame on me for not flagging that and shame on you for us not working that out. And that's where it is. So even when it deals is when you lose a deal, it's having that conversation where you're like, all right, and being honest with yourself, where you're like, what didn't you do? And the reality is there probably is something you forgot to do or you didn't do as well, or you didn't make that extra call, or you just didn't proofread that proposal, or you didn't have your coworker or partner review it, right? Yeah. And those are those things. And that's how it all ties together. What do you think that is, you, if that extra 10%, is that a blind spot? In other words, they, you know, in, in some cases, maybe someone doesn't know any better to ask the next question or to follow up here or to do this or to do that. Is it, is it someone who's just, you know, they don't want to put in the effort? Is it a combination of a number of different things that can go on? Or, or is there, or in your experience, is there a commonality that, you know, there's something across all that 10% or that? Yeah, I think the commonality is having a difficult time prioritizing where they should spend that 10%. Mm. So it can seem completely overwhelming, mm. right? So whether it's um, 
eating or staying fit or just being a better person. It's just like, oh my gosh, you need to be a better person. So I should wake up and do yoga and do my affirmations. It's like, whew. you're like, it's overwhelming. How about you just say to people like, hey, how you doing, right? Like, why do you start there? So when you think about a proposal or deals or any of those things, it's, well, hey, Jay, you know, I, I'm fine doing proposals. I've done them all myself. You're like, all right, why don't you have me review them? No, 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 I don't want you to review them. Okay, how about having someone in customer success take a look at them, right? And, and, it's, and it's that, so a, a phrase of mine that I use is, I don't need exponential, I need incremental. Mm. And so you build skills by and build success by having that incremental on it. So you, you build a good proposal, you think it's good, you have someone else review it, they go, hey, here's some suggestions you should make find you incorporate those suggestions. You might lose the deal. Maybe your champion says, you know what? That was an awesome proposal. Sorry, we couldn't win the deal. You're like, great, fine. I, I, I nailed that proposal. I'll move that over there. All right, what are the other things I could work on? Maybe I could work on pricing better. I could work on positioning better. I could work on skills better. You look at a lot of areas where we spend time coaching and paying money for all these things. And then yet when it comes to work, we almost have a visceral reaction where, you know, we should we spend two hours doing live prep for something. Oh, no, 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 we're not going to do that. Well, you know, would we send our men and women out to fight without training, right? Uh, you look at professional sports teams do it. Fine, I didn't play sports in college. You're a musician. Okay, how much time did you spend practicing for that, That's right? You go through all of these things and you say, well, why don't we do it professionally? <laughs> and a lot of people don't. So it, it's... I, I think it's it's overwhelming, right? When you sit there and you look, and if you compare yourself, what you do, you know, I ran three and a half miles yesterday. I was like, yay me, I ran three and a half miles. And then I look, you know, Cameron Hayes did, I think like 20. Right? Like, oh my God, I'm never going to do that. But the point is like, you don't have to do that, right? Right. Just run three and a half every day. And maybe you can run, maybe, maybe that's all that you need, right? So maybe all that you need is review that proposal and have someone else take a look at that. So build those blocks of success around it. And that's where when you have, I think, heavy handed oppressive management, it's mm -hmm. like, well, you didn't do your proposal and you didn't do your calls. You didn't, and that's where people, they're just like, I, too much, mm -hmm. right? I walk and if you think, mm -hmm. yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, please. No, I was just going to be glib and say, I walked the three and a half miles. So where does that leave me? <laughs> well, but it's, it's, it's getting there, right? I mean, people right. look all the time and it's in, you, you see people in the gym who don't, you know, who aren't jacked or whatever. And you're like, good for them. They're in the gym. Mm. Right. And, and, and it's that aspect of it where with work, you want to support the environment where people get that way. Right. So if you're constantly badgering people that the work that they do isn't great and here's the things they failed on, I don't know how that helps me get better. Pointing out the things I suck at doesn't want to make me do any better. What you could do is like, hey, here's areas we can improve or here's areas we could work on. What do you think? Here's four areas. What are the ones we could work on? What should we go ahead and do? And maybe it's something benign. Maybe it's, oh, we just need to work on how we pitch pricing. Maybe it's something very specific where you present really poorly. Let's work on your presenting skills. And then people get better job satisfaction. People feel better loyalty to the company. People feel that there's less of a risk in terms of having those things, right? Productivity improves. So all of those aspects inside of it, and that's where you have to do it. So I, um, you know, I have different people. If I have something that's really important to have to send out, you know, I'll ask other people inside the company to take a look at it and I'll gain input on people. And it's, it's like, why not, right? Um, what about your, um, you mentioned the, some of the, the things that people who are challenged have, which is not necessarily prioritizing, um, what they, what they should do, right? They know what to do, but it's just prioritizing. What are some of the best managers that you've led, um, done? What are they, what, what are some of the behaviors of some of the activities that, that, that they do? I mean, maybe they were mentors of yours as well. But. Sure. Uh, it's being very prescriptive and structured in terms of the day and how they engage, mm -hmm. right? So if I think of Bill Dietrich, who I worked for at, uh, at our Sam, you know, he, he had a playbook and in terms of you know, the metrics that you needed, what was important, how you interview, all of those things. And he really used it more as, a, as it certainly was a playbook, but it was also guiding. There was flexibility inside there. And I remember he'd say to me like, oh, there's certain things you have to worry about and there's certain things 
need to worry about, but maybe on a scale of one to 10, there may be 12, right? So yeah, once you get rid of these one to 10, then you can focus on the other. Hmm. Um, there are other people who, you know, when I followed, so uh, Guy Harold Collette I worked with was very sort of culture driven, right? And have the team built around there. Um, so when, when I look at what they brought to the table, there was something that I would define as singularly they were disciplined around and then they built either their individual brand or they built the company brand around it. So maybe they're just so keenly focused around operations. They just totally got that dialed in. Maybe they were heavily focused around sales process. Maybe they were heavily focused around building a corporate culture. So it's not that one of those things is better than the other. What I found is that all of them uniquely reflected their personality. So if you went and worked for this type of person, you could expect that mm. around there. And that was something that yeah, early in my career, I thought that all of them were were the same, right? If you're going to be VP of sales, you need to drive a Porsche convertible and wear a mock turtleneck and a sport coat, right? And that is totally, thank God, not the case, right? And there's a multitude of people. And as we as more people with with different backgrounds and different perspectives come into the mix, you see that there are just so many different ways to solve the safe problem. And the big mistake we all make is thinking, whether it's me or anyone else, like I singularly have the answer, mm, right. right? And it's not, but look, you still need to come with a playbook. You still need to come with a structure on board. You can't just come and be like, eh, whatever. And that's where earlier on in our conversation, I said, I still have my 369 plan and there are things I still look at and there's, and there's aspects I still analyze and I'm working through what next year is going to work and look like, but it's still an iterative process as you move through it. And you need to be flexible and confident enough in yourself that if plan A doesn't work, you got a plan B, right? Elizabeth Holmes with Theranos, you know, she always had that quote where she's like, if you have a plan B, then you're just, you know, not bought into plan A. Well, but plan A for her was complete fraud uh, right. in terms of the company, right? So you're like, well, where was right. your plan B? You didn't have a plan B. So <laughs> right. you're like, that's a terrible quote. That makes no sense whatsoever. How does it, so. Right, right. By the way, I have a good friend who's a VP of sales who bought a red Porsche last year. <laughs> which I Look, I, yeah, no, no worries, but you know what I mean. You're, I know, you've been no, in this I'm industry long enough, right? <laughs> Where... <laughs> of course. No, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll bust his chops later on this. I'll say, listen to this. This guy's making fun of you. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no laugh. You'll know exactly what it is, <laughs> right? Yeah, he's funny. Um, all right. Well, I have so much to, that I want to cover with you. I feel like we need to do a part two of this at some point, but let me, in the interest of your time and the listeners, time who you know maybe in their car getting ready to their final destination um you know, not final final destination but the, you know where they want to go sure. um that uh we'll get into what i call the rapid fire five questions we're asking five questions give me five answers and the listeners can get to know bradley pastor a little Absolutely. bit more all right here we go yep um what are you most excited about right now either personally or professionally um uh, I'm excited about our, our team just went through a bunch of uh, personality training. So if you're familiar with like disc profiles and things like that. Mm -hmm. So I'm really excited to see how we can start communicating more effectively and better with each other and how that extends out towards our interaction with customers, given that we're all remote. So we finished that last week and feedback was really positive and I'm looking forward to seeing how we do that. Oh, very cool. Yes. Um, what activity do you miss most since the pandemic started? I miss spontaneity. Like you just can't go and just do something, right? Like I need my mask, I need my hand sanitizer. And if it's dinner, <laughs> right. you need to schedule, you need to book it and all it just like, it'd be great to just, you know, go out and have a, a drink at a bar with my wife, right? right? Like you can't do that anymore. So spontaneity is gone. I'll take yeah. that and then we can sort of figure out <laughs> what underneath it <laughs> works, you know? Yeah, it's, it's a good point. You're right about that. I never thought about that. The spontaneity, not just necessarily that you have to make reservations, but there's no, there's literally no spontaneity. He goes, let's just go over here. Let's just walk in here and, and grab a drink. Can't do it. Right. Like if you and I were local and I said, hey, Jay, let's just, you know, yeah. lo enjoy the podcast. Let's get together. I'd be like, oh, well, I don't, you know, like you can't. Right. It's right. brutal. Yeah, absolutely. And then there's the, all, all the thinking around it too, as well, you know? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, what do you want to get better at right now? Um, I, I'm working on becoming more disciplined around just having that structure like we talked about. So structuring out my day, I'm having some more responsibilities I'm taking on. So how do you stack all that and package it all together and make sure that you follow up? So that's something that I've really tried to buckle down the last month and, you know, we'll see hopefully that that keeps going. 
What are you most, what keeps you motivated? Um, my internal ticker in terms of that, my, my children keep me, you know, you want to set a, a good example for them, both as a person professionally and, and have that all balance. And I also, I made a commitment to my company and the people that I work with, and they made a commitment back to me. And I want to see that we execute and we deliver on those things. Right. Absolutely. And can you share a piece of advice or tool that helps you stay productive? Pen and paper. It's not sexy, but having a notebook, writing stuff down. Yeah, there you go. You know, I mean, that is, you know, let's do some LinkedIn stuff here, right? It's the ultimate hack. It is, <laughs> right? right? It never crashes on me. I always have it. It works out really, really well. Sometimes I can't read my handwriting, but that's my problem. Maybe that'll be one of the things, Jay, I'll add to the list about what I'm working on. But yeah, <laughs> pad and paper, write it down, go back. It's awesome. We're doing homeschool with my daughter. I think my daughter's handwriting is probably better than mine. She's in second grade and I'm looking at mine. <laughs> Maybe I should go back and learn <laughs> what this is all about. Uh, exactly. Actually, one other question, which are uh, two easy questions, which is, yep. um, are you hiring and how can people get in touch with you? Sure. So uh, fortunately, we hired a bunch of people this year. So I don't have plans to hire anyone in the next six months, but certainly people can feel free to reach out to me. You can find me on LinkedIn or you can email me directly at bradley.pastor. So B-R-A-D-L-E-Y dot pastor, P-A-S-T-E-R at riskmethods.net. Bradley dot pastor. That's correct. Riskmethods.net. Bradley Pastor, thank you yes, sir. for helping us all be smarter today and going over quota. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Really enjoyed it. Absolutely. Goodbye, everybody. Cue the music.